Good evening. I'm Kelly Gear Ripkin, National Chair of A Woman's Journey. On behalf of Johns Hopkins Medicine's A Woman's Journey, I want to thank you for joining us this evening for our monthly webcast series, Health Conversations That Matter. A Woman's Journey strives to improve your well being through health education. According to the National Institutes of Health, 60 to 70 million people are affected by digestive diseases. Other sources state that digestive disorders is one of the common things that hospitalize most Americans. Tonight, we are pleased to be joined by gastroenterologist, Dr. Aline Shabadi, who serves as the clinical director of gastroenterology and director of the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center at Sibley Memorial Hospital. So please use your Q&A on your screen to ask your questions to Dr. Shabadi, who will respond during the last 15 to 20 minutes of tonight's conversation. Our web class, as usual, will end at 8 p.m. And I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank Johns Hopkins University's program, Hopkins at Home, for their production assistance. And you can visit their website for additional lectures and courses throughout the year. And now I am pleased to welcome Dr. Aline Sherbani. Good evening. Thank you, Kelly, for this nice introduction. Again, my name is Aline Sherabadi. I'm a gastroenterologist with a focus on inflammatory bowel disease, and this is what we're going to talk about today. So I really appreciate everybody who tuned in or who's going to uh, follow the recording later. So, of course, inflammatory bowel disease is a big topic, and my goal tonight with you is not to cover everything. I really want to focus on uh, what is inflammatory bowel disease, what are the symptoms, how do we make the diagnosis, and what are our goals of care? What are the principles uh, of taking care of uh, people living with IBD, and what is your role as a patient or caregiver of someone living with IBD? What is your role in, uh, in this uh, treatment management? I'm going to talk a little bit about diet because I get asked a lot of questions about diet uh, from my patients living with IBD. And I want to talk a little bit about mental health because often we don't talk enough about mental health with any of those GI illnesses. So it's important to talk about this and focus a little bit on health maintenance, uh, looking at uh, uh, what we need to do to prevent complication from the disease and complication from treatment. And of course, since we're talking about a woman's journey, I want to focus on inflammatory bowel disease in women during the pregnancy uh, period. And finally, we'll touch upon health disparities in IBD. It's important, uh, I think, for all of us to recognize that uh, some uh, population do not have access to quality of care and the right care. And it's important for all of us to advocate for everyone to have access to quality care uh, when they need it. All right, so why are we talking about inflammatory bowel disease? It is becoming a very common disease. Uh, we typically think about inflammatory bowel disease as a disease affecting mainly Caucasian, North, uh, Northern European and North Americans. But in most recent years and last 20 years, what's been happening is IBD is really affecting uh, uh, people from all races and all ethnicities all around the world. In the United States, we're seeing more and more cases of inflammatory bowel disease in everyone, including in minorities such as Blacks and Hispanics and immigrants uh, that uh, came from countries where IBD was not common. And when they come to uh, the United States or to any other westernized country, their risk of IBD is increasing. We're also seeing an increase in IBD in recently westernized countries, um, so such as uh, 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 countries in Africa, the Middle East, uh, China, Brazil, South America, etc. So IBD is really becoming a global pr uh, problem, and if you're joining us from different places of the world, um, you know, that is a testimony to that, that anyone can be affected with IBD. In terms of age where it starts, it can really affect anyone at any age. We do have, unfortunately, uh, kids as, as, as uh, young as uh, age one or even earlier uh, that can be affected with IBD and or it can start later in life. But there's two uh, major um, or two uh, time, uh, you know, two 
um, <laughs> uh, two age group, if you want, where it's most common for this disease to start anywhere between age 15 and 30 and later in life between age 50 and 70. What causes IBD? Uh, the answer is uh, very complex. Uh, probably there's some genetics uh, involved, but also uh, something in the environment triggers probably this inflammation in the gut. And then this inflammation in the gut is not able to be uh, stopped or downregulated unless we uh, provide the right therapy. Family history is important, um, but only 10% of people living with IBD have a family history. So if you don't have anybody in your family with inflammatory bowel disease, it doesn't mean you cannot have inflammatory bowel disease, okay? All right, so what happens in patients uh, with inflammatory bowel disease? What happens in, in, in simple term is that there's an inflammation that occur in the gut, most commonly in the colon, uh, and that inflammation leads to abdominal pain, diarrhea, bleeding, and other symptoms. Uh, we have two major um, uh, categories, if you want, or two major disease under inflammatory bowel disease. Ulcerative colitis affects only the colon. It can affect only one part of the colon, the last part, what we call the rectum, or it can affect um, the left side of the colon or the entire colon. Crohn's disease can affect the GI tract anywhere uh, from the mouth to anus. So uh, the colon, the small bowel, the stomach, uh, the, the food pipe. So Crohn's can be more of a patchy inflammation, get, can affect different parts of the bowel. But what they do have in common is this inflammation that can get worse uh, at times. That's what we call a flare-up. And that can get better on its own before the next flare-up. In addition to GI symptoms, this disease can also affect other system in our body, and we'll talk about that. So in terms of GI symptoms, as you can imagine, if your colon is inflamed, uh, you're going to have abdominal pain, diarrhea, blood in the stool. Uh, often patients complain of this sense of like constantly needing to go to the bathroom, even if there's no stool. Sometimes we're just passing gas or a little bit of blood or a little bit of mucus. Often there's urgency. So we're not able to control our bowels, right? So we have to run to the bathroom and sometimes we cannot make it to the bathroom and this is where we can have incontinence. Very important if you have IBD, when you're talking to your, your doctor is really to talk about all these symptoms, right? So there's nothing embarrassing you can tell your GI doctor and often patients might hide because they're embarrassed the fact that they're having to run to the bathroom or they're incontinent or sometimes patients have to wear uh, diapers or pads, or they worry about leaving the house because of these symptoms. Tell your doctor, tell your medical team about this, because this really highlights the severity of your disease and can really help your doctor decide on what kind of therapy you need best. In patients with Crohn's disease, we can get complication in the bowel, such as blockages, abscesses, fistulas, which are abnormal tracts between the bowel and other part of the bowel, or the bowel and the skin, the bowel and the bladder. And patients with Crohn's disease can suffer from what we call perianal disease. This is when there's abnormal tract between the bowel and the skin around the anus that can cause uh, pus and pain and abscesses developing in that area. This inflammation happening in the gut can affect your entire body, right? So often patients can have fatigue and anemia and malnutrition and just losing weight, not ab being able to sleep. Again, all these are symptoms that are important to be uh, to share with your medical team so that we know how to uh, help with these symptoms. So in addition to GI symptoms, this is a disease that affects uh, other parts of the body. So similar to having inflammation in the gut, you can have inflammation also in the joints. So joint pains, whether uh, pains in the knees or the hands or the back can be part of inflammatory bowel disease. Skin inflammation that can manifest like a rash or like having a big mosquito bite or an ulcer can be part of IBD. Eye inflammation, uh, disease of the um, liver and the biliary uh, tree. So all these things are uh, related to IBD. So again, a good reminder that if you're already diagnosed with IBD and you develop any symptom outside the bowel, talk to your GI team about it because it can, this can be related to inflammatory bowel disease. But also this highlights the fact that it's important to have a team of doctors taking care of you if you're having symptoms outside the GI tract. So often um, uh, patients will have a team in addition to the gastroenterologist have a rheumatologist that takes care of the joint and dermatologist that takes care of the skin. And all these doctors have to talk to each other and to the patient to find the best course of care. So 
we have this disease, how do we treat it? And I really want to go over those principles of treatment with you because I think it's people living with IBD understand what's important uh, in the management of their disease. They're, that people feel people are become more empowered in really uh, reaching these goals and understanding why we're we doing these tests. Why do we do blood work and stool tests and colonoscopy and MRI? It's not to torture people. It's really because we want to make sure that your disease is under control, the inflammation is under control, and that we're not developing complication of the disease. So there's two steps in terms of treatment: the induction and maintenance. Induction means you're coming in with a flare, you're having all these symptoms, bleeding, diarrhea, pain, losing weight, we want to get you better quickly. Maintenance is after we get you better quickly, we want to keep you better because these are long-term or lifelong disease. So once we get you better, we want to keep you better and prevent another flare and prevent complication. That's why we talk about maintenance. Often the same drug is used for induction and maintenance. The only exception is when we use steroids. So if you've been on steroid, on prednisone, this is to control the flare quickly, but then prednisone is never a long-term treatment because it has so many side effects and it's not effective at controlling uh, inflammation long-term. So if you we get you better with prednisone, after that we have to tra transition to a long-term treatment. So. What does it mean? What are our goals? So, of course, we want you to feel better, but we want to go beyond that. We want all these symptoms, all the GI symptoms to go away, all the extra intestinal symptoms, if you're having the joint pain, the skin rash, the eye inflammation, to be resolved. But in addition to that, we want to prove that the inflammation is under control. It's a little bit what I tell my patient. It's a little bit when you, in your, when you were a kid or college and you come home and you tell your parents, I did great on my test. Well, they're going to be like, well, we want to prove. I want to see that those grades. Or you might come home and say, I really didn't do well on the test, but you get your grade and you got an A+. Plus. Sometimes the symptoms and how we're feeling don't really match what's going in the colon. So we want to have a proof that the inflammation is under control. And this is when your doctor orders these stool tests or blood work looking for uh, markers of inflammation, CRP, fecal caprotectin, lactoferrin. You might have heard these terms. We want to see these markers of inflammation becoming normal. And one step further, when we look again in your colon, when we do a colonoscopy again or an MRI of the small bowel, we want to see that the bowel has healed. And the reason we want this is because by healing the bowel, we're preventing another flare, but also we're preventing complications of the disease that can need surgery and can create really uh, uh, dis uh, disability in uh, someone's life. So what kind of treatment we have? So this is a very fancy slide. I like to put it up there because it, you know, it sounds like very, it looks very scientific and basic science and fancy, but you do not have to uh, review all this. But basically this is really to kind of um, remind everyone that we made a lot of progress in terms of uh, treatment for inflammatory bowel disease. And the reason we made this progress is because we understand now what's going on in the colon or in the small bowel that's causing the inflammation. We understand that, you know, there are inflammatory cells that are uh, that leave the uh, blood vessel and go into the colon to create inflammation. These inflammatory cells produce uh, substances we call cytokine that create inflammation. And these cytokines destroy um, the lining of the bowel and create more inflammation and more damage. So by understanding what's going on in the bowel, um, we can manufacture and create treatment that block these inflammatory cells or block the production of inflammatory cytokine or block the cytokine itself. So this is a nice diagram to show that inflammation of uh, in inflammatory bowel disease is very complex. There are different things happening at the same time. And every drug that we have on the market, what it's doing, it's blocking different part of this inflammation, either blocking inflammatory cell from getting into the bowel, blocking inflammatory cell from producing cytokine, or blocking the cytokine, those inflammatory substance from creating more damage in the bowel. So that's how we have many treatment options at this point. I'm not going to go over each one of them that will be like, you know, a whole day spending on that. The main uh, message here is that we do have medication that works for both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and some who works only for one or the other. But the main message here again is that when we use steroids, 
to induce remission, meaning to control the flare. After this, we need to move on to one of those other therapies. Steroids should never be used as a maintenance treatment or as the only treatment for IBD where we're just taking steroids anytime we're not feeling good or we're having a flare because steroids is really associated with so many side effects, including diabetes, high blood pressure, osteoporosis, breaking of the bone, insomnia, infertil uh, insomnia and irritability, and also actually uh, um, um, it's a treatment that's most associated with a high risk of death and complications. So Every one of the medications for IBD has its potential risks, but we know the risk and we know how to control those risks. But the key here is that the one that is has the, carries the most risk is really steroids, even though people find it easy to take and easy to prescribe. So if we're having all these medications uh, available to us, how do we choose the right treatment? And this is really why it's very personalized, right? So every patient, uh, we, we sit down with the patient and that's why, that's why also it's important for a patient living with IBD to communicate with their doctor, their symptoms, their symptoms outside the GI tract, their needs, their plans for life, what are their goals, why they want to get better, so that together we can decide what is the best ther therapy. So we base our choice on the severity of the disease. You know, is this disease involving most of your bowels, a small part of the bowel? When we did a colonoscopy, did it look a little bit inflamed or very inflamed? If you have symptoms outside the GI tract, if you have other disease, other immune disease, so you might have Crohn's and psoriasis or rheumatoid arthritis, and there are certain treatments that can treat all these conditions together. So we want to choose one medication for all of these conditions as opposed to multiple medication. Or do you have any other diseases that will prevent us from using certain therapies, right? So this is where it's very important to let your doctor know if you have heart disease, um, um, a history of cancer, um, diabetes, infections, uh, et cetera, um, because certain therapy might need to be avoided if you have um, certain uh, diseases. And also, what is your method of preference, you know, that we have drugs that we can give by mouth, you know, oral medication, injection, infusions. Do you have a car to drive to an infusion center? Do you have joint pain that prevents you from doing injection? So it's all, all this is very important. Are you planning to start a family? Certain medication are not indicated and people are pregnant. So it's important to avoid these medication. And then finally discussing the risk of the drugs that we have available their risks to you, right? We all have different risks uh, pattern, meaning, you know, if I'm somebody who travels a lot to area of the world or living in area of the world where, where tuberculosis is common, then certain medication that increase the risk of tuberculosis are not good for me. But if I live in a city where tuberculosis is not common, then that medication doesn't carry that risk for me. So the risk and the safety of every drug needs to be looked at for every patient, as well as the risk of not using the right drug, what's going to happen? How can this, my disease evolve into more complication? So we put all this together to choose the right treatment for the right patients in this area where we have multiple choices uh, in terms of therapy. Now, in addition to choosing the right treatment for IBD, um, it doesn't stop here. So, and before we go further, I want to highlight the fact that sometimes surgery is the right treatment. And surgery is not like the last, um, we, like the last option or uh, something to avoid. So there are some complications, for example, when we have blockage from crowns, when we have fistula, we need the surgeon on board. So sometimes surgery is the right solution for us, not always, but sometimes, and it's important to recognize that. Now, in addition to choosing the right treatment for IBD, treatment of IBD doesn't stop there. Right? So like we were talking uh, before, when you have a lot of inflammation and can create fatigue and malnutrition, you're not absorbing the nutrients, you're losing some nutrients from the bowel that's inflamed. So it's important to correct the anemia, important to correct if we have deficiency in iron and B12. So really looking at the nutrition status and reassessing um, the disease regularly. So IBD is a disease where it's very important to establish a team um, of GI doctors and other doctors that you're going to follow for a long time. So you want to establish this connection with someone you trust, someone you uh, enjoy working with, because this is a long-term relationship. 
um, because IBD is a lifelong disease that requires constant monitoring, reassessment, readjustment. So that is why we bring people back to clinic. That is why we keep doing these blood work. It's really to make sure that the disease is healed and we're not um, um, uh, overlooking a potential complication. It's important to tell your team about any symptom you have, any new symptoms. And there are certain drugs where we need to monitor the level. We need to monitor blood work to make sure the drugs are not causing side effects uh, to your body. And uh, it's very important to realize that people living with IBD um, uh, have, have high risk of certain complications like infections and cancer. And so it's very important to be up to date in terms of your screening, in terms of monitoring, and in terms of certain tests. So we'll talk about this. So in terms of monitoring the disease, like I was saying, you know, you might feel really well, but still have inflammation in the gut, or you might not feel too good. You might still feel like, you know, I'm still having some cramps and diarrhea, but when the doctors perform a colonoscopy, everything looked good inside. So your symptoms might be due to something else like lactose intolerance or irritable bowel syndrome or celiac disease or other things that can cause symptoms. So that is why it's important for us to have objective measures of whether or not your bowel is healed. Uh, and this can be done with blood work, like the CRP, with stool tests, like fecal carprotectin, colonoscopy, intestinal ultrasound, MRI. So there's different ways and your doctor will choose a test that's adapted to your disease and to really make sure that not only you're feeling good, but the disease is healed. So it's important to understand that so that you recognize the need to have this routine follow-up every few months and routine blood work or stool studies and, and a colonoscopy at certain intervals. So what is the health maintenance that we uh, I've been talking about? What, you know, what we want to do in addition to treating IBD, its symptom, preventing its complication, keeping an eye on potential side effects from medication, we also want to prevent complications. So I, people living with IBD, especially if they're on medication that affect the immune system, are at high risk of infection and certain cancer. So we need to monitor that. We need to do our screening and we need to do our preventive uh, measures. So in terms of vaccine, if you have IBD, you can have all age appropriate vaccine. Often patients with IBD are worried about having vaccine. They feel maybe the vaccine might trigger symptoms of their IBD or they might not respond well to, um, to the vaccine. It's important to know that as a, someone living with IBD, you can have all the vaccine except if you are on medication that affect the immune system, which are most of the medication that we have for IBD, you cannot have live virus vaccine. And the main live virus vaccine that we have is the MMR, the measles, mumps, uh, and or if you're traveling in certain areas, maybe where there's yellow fever, yellow fever is a live virus vaccine. So talk to your doctor before getting uh, such vaccine. It's important to get the flu shot every year to prevent pneumonia and bronchitis and HPV vaccine if you're in that age group that uh, needs it. Now, there's certain vaccine that are not the age-appropriate vaccine, meaning you, know, you might be 20 years old and still need the vaccine that people who are 50 or 60 years old need to get. Why? It's, again, because uh, people with IBD have a higher risk of infection, especially if there are certain medication. So Two vaccine, pneumococcal vaccine is to prevent pneumonias. We usually, in the general population, people with IBD, we give that after age 50 or 60. Uh, people living with IBD need to get that vaccine to prevent pneumonia. And the shingle vaccine, especially if you're on drugs from the class of JAK inhibitor, these are drugs that increase the risk of shingle. So it's important to get the shingle vaccine. Shingle vaccine is approved for people above age 50, but it's also approved in young people if they have IBD. So uh, these are two vaccines extra to get. Uh, people living with IBD are high risk of skin cancer, especially again, if they're on medication that affect the, the, uh, their immune system. So it's important to go to the dermatologist once a year, get a skin check, make sure there's no abnormal mole and wear sunscreen while you're outdoor or like a cap, a hat, you know, things that protect your skin from uh, sunburn. Women should get a pap smear routinely, uh, maybe more often than the general population if they are on immunosuppressive drug. And finally, colonoscopy. Nobody likes to get colonoscopy. That prep is awful. It's not getting, it's getting a little bit better with time, but it's never easy. But people with IBD that affect their colon are at higher risk of colon cancer after eight years of disease. 
if you have IBD and a complication called PSC or primary sclerosing cholangitis, it's a disease of the bile duct of the liver, then your risk of colon cancer is higher and you need a colonoscopy every year starting from the time of diagnosis. So these are one of the reasons why we perform colonoscopy in people with IBD is to screen them for their high risk of colon cancer. All right, so shifting gears, um, like I said, the incidence of IBD is increasing, meaning we're having more and more people um, developing IBD at in all age group, all ethnicity, all race, all around the world. So what is going on? So I had said that probably, you know, the reason for IBD is very complex. We don't understand everything, but probably people who have IBD have some genetic predisposition, they're immune system in the gut is not working well, and then something in the environment trigger inflammation that keeps on going. Um, we know that smoking increases the risk of Crohn's disease, but in recent years, we're, st we're starting to look at other risk factors that could be a trigger. Now, what I want everybody to realize is that it's not something wrong that you've done. You didn't bring it on yourself. People feel like, oh, I ate the wrong thing. I, I went on the wrong trip. That is not it. And you could have the perfect diet, never smoked, never took any medication in your life and still develop IBD. So I want to put this, um, you know, the risk factors that we're understanding are important to understand because this is maybe how we can prevent IBD in, 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 our, in the next generation by understanding what could make it more likely to happen. But it doesn't mean that you did something wrong and that's why you have IBD. And it doesn't mean that, um, you know, if you've never been exposed to these risk factor that you're immune to IBD, right? So IBD can still happen. We don't understand fully what's going on, but I want to review some risk factor with you. So like I said, we're having this increase in IBD. So what changed? Our genetics haven't changed, right? Our genetics don't change that quick. What have changed is really our environment. So that's why we're looking at the environment as potential risk factor for developing IBD. You know, when, when, when I was a kid, my parents will be like, you go outside. I would be playing outside in the dirt with my friends until it was uh, time for dinner and we come home. Now I have to, and, and, and our parents had to like beg us to come back home, right? We wanted to be outside all the time. Now it's the other way around. My kids are sitting on in front of the computer, in front of video games, and I have to beg them to go outside. So our physical activity has changed. Our uh, you know, exposure to dirt and, and play and, you know, and putting things in our mouth and discovering things and nourishing actually our gut with those good bacteria has, has gone, you know, so we became very hygienic. We, you know, nobody touched anything that's dirty. We wash our hands 50 times a day. Uh, you know, we're using uh, soap, which is great because we have less infection, but what this has translated to is also our gut um, um, you know, um, building up a good microbiome. These are the good bacteria in our gut that protects us from certain diseases. Our diet has changed, right? We're eating so much less fruits and vegetables and legumes. And most of us are living on the go. We're busy. We grab, you know, a protein bar. We grab a burger. We grab a soda. And uh, these are all processed uh, food. They're not found naturally in, in, in nature, um, you know, whether it's added sugar or fake sugar, all our diet has changed. And even if you're trying to eat healthy, you know, I put a picture of a chicken that's two months old from the 1950. Look how it looks sick, but it's a normal chicken. Uh, and you, and next to it is a chicken that's one month old uh, from our, you know, from now. And you can see that chicken is like plumpy, right? So everything we're overfeeding our, you know, I'm giving the example of the chicken, but how we overfeed them and, and use antibiotic and use growth hormone, all these things. So even if you're eating a chicken, it's no longer the same chicken that we ate 50 years ago. Antibiotic have been recently uh, associated with an increased risk of IBD. So there've been few studies in the uh, in, in kids and few studies in adults that show that the more antibiotic you use, the higher the likelihood of developing IBD a uh, few years later. Um, whatever the antibiotic is. So probably what the antibiotics are doing is that they're changing again. They may be decreasing the good bacteria in our gut and maybe promoting the bacteria that cause more inflammation, but it's changing our gut microbiome. It doesn't mean that antibiotics are bad. If you have an infection from a bacteria, you do need antibiotics. But I think we're also becoming society where we take antibiotic for anything, a little bit of fever, a little bit of sore throat. 
often these things are viral and we're still taking antibiotics. So it's important to limit antibiotic when they're not needed. So I'm going to focus a little bit on diet. So the Western diet, so what we eat a lot of in the US and what we see more and more in Westernized countries, and we're seeing the more we eat, the more there's this Westernized way of eating, we see IBD increasing and also other immune disease and diabetes and obesity. So you know, this type of diet has really affected our body in so many different ways. So a diet that's high in carbs and sugar, right? So the sodas, the, the, the sweet, the donuts, you know, too many, too many sweets. Um, our diet is high in animal fat from red meat, high in animal protein. We eat a lot of like red meat, processed food. So processed food is anything that comes in a bag or in a box that's processed food. Uh, so those cere breakfast cereals that are supposed to be healthy for us, these are ultra processed actually. So, so that's what I tell people. So that your bag of potato chips, your hot dog, your, um, you know, uh, those healthy nutritious bars, this is not found normally in nature. These are all processed food and processed food contain also um, substances to uh, make them last for long or, um, or blend all these ingredients together uh, or uh, give them better taste. So the emulsifier, the food additive, the colorants, all these are non-natural things that our body is supposed to get. So our gut gets irritated from that. And we're eating much larger quantity than we ever ate in the history of mankind. And we're eating less fruits and vegetables. So this kind of diet is affecting the gut directly uh, also affecting the gut microbiome, those bacteria that are living in our gut that could be good for us or bad for us, depending on what kind of bacteria are there. And it's uh, really affecting the lining of our gut uh, and our gut immune system. Um, so there's something about um, this diet that is increasing our risk of developing IBD. So what do I tell my patient is to do the reverse, right? So eat what, what you usually, what, what in your plate, you have to recognize what is naturally present in, 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 in nature, right? So it doesn't mean it has to be bland. You can add the spices and the ingredients and everything that you want. It just, it's important to avoid processed food as much as possible, avoid added sugar, the sodas, the, uh, you know, the excess uh, uh, meat and really increase fruits and vegetables. Of course, when you're living with IBD, anybody who's ever had diarrhea knows that if you eat a salad while you're having diarrhea, you're gonna have more diarrhea and cramps. So of course, when you're in a flare, you know, you might want to avoid fruits and vegetables just because they make your symptom worse. But once things are in remission, it's important to include fruits and vegetables in the form that you can tolerate, you know, it doesn't have to be raw, it could be cooked, it could be in a smoothie, it could be blended in a soup. So whatever form you tolerate, and it's important to adapt diet to taste and culture. That's why I don't recommend one specific diet, right? So a Indian diet is different than a Middle Eastern diet, different than a uh, Caribbean diet, different than a, you know, so adopt the diet to your taste and culture. And it's important, I think, at, at a larger level to really advocate for you know, healthier ingredients to advocate for um, better access to healthy food. You know, when I go to the grocery store, you know, the lettuce costs more than, um, you know, a bag of potato chips. So, you know, um, it costs more to eat healthy and that's not how it should be. Uh, it's also important for us to advocate that our patients living with IBD can have access to nutritionists and dietitian and that will be paid for by insurance. So a lot of work to be done to allow people to have access to healthier option. And um, the other thing I want to touch upon is really the mental health. Um, mental health is often taboo. It's in a lot of culture, in a lot of societies, including in, in the U.S. and a lot of places around the world. And uh, I, the, the message I want to get there is that if you're living with IBD or any other chronic GI illness or any chronic illness, of course, your emotional health is going to, and mental health is going to be affected. And it's important to talk about this to your doctor, your primary care doctor, your GI doctors, because treatments are available. You know, when you're living with a disease where you have to run to the bathroom, when you're passing blood, when you're afraid to leave the house because you might, you know, soil yourself or you cannot get to your kid's soccer game because you're so tired when you have so many appointments with your doctor and tests and colonoscopy, of course, this is going to affect your social life, your personal life, your, um, your intimacy uh, with your partner, uh, you know, your family life, your capacity to work, to study, and all this is a great burden on, on your mental health. So very important to talk about it and address it. Uh, you know, we have good data showing that people living with IBD have like post-traumatic stress symptoms, uh, especially after being in the hospital. 
and that there's a high incidence of depression and anxiety in people living with IBD. And, you know, it's a little bit like the chicken and the egg. If you have IBD and you have dealing with all this, it creates depression and anxiety. But also what we found is that dep having depression and anxiety can trigger a flare. So, and actually there's some studies showing that treating depression and anxiety uh, prevent further flare of IBD. So very important to treat depression and anxiety over, of course, to have an overall healthy mental health and mental life, but also because it can have a positive impact on your inflammatory bowel disease. So the next few slides are going to focus on women. Uh, so if you're a woman or if you have a woman in your life, this is important. It's important to know, um, you know, because like I said, IBD often affect young people between age 15 and 30. So we, we are going to talk about pregnancy uh, because there's a lot of questions about, is IBD going to impact my pregnancy? Is pregnancy going to affect my IBD? Are medications safe? The key message here, is that a healthy mom and a healthy pregnancy means a healthy baby. What does it mean? Is that we need to keep IBD under control with the medication that are working throughout before conception, throughout pregnancy, in order to have a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby. And for the most part, uh, most medication for IBD are safe during pregnancy and breastfeeding, and we'll go over what is not safe. So, Let's start with fertility. Fertility in women with IBD is similar to other women of the same age. Few exception, uh, often women with IBD might choose not to have kids because they, they, they're not feeling good. They're not feeling up to starting a family. They might be dealing with depression or low libido or pain or poor body image because of the symptoms and the uh, complication of IBD. And some, um, um, uh, women or some and some men who are in a relationship and, and potentially want a family are afraid to pass on IBD. We said there is a family history, that family history can increase the risk of IBD, but it's important to know that that risk is, is limited. So if you are a, somebody with IBD, the risk of your child having IBD is two to 5%. So if you have hundred kids, two to five of them will have IBD. So the risk is there, but it's not huge. So that should not prevent us from um, becoming parents. Uh, there are certain things that do affect fertility. However, if you have active inflammation that decrease um, fertility, in men, two drugs can decrease fertility, sofasalazine and methotrexate. So if you are a man with IBD and planning to start a family and you're on, on one of these drugs, talk to your doctor to convert you to a different drug because that can affect fertility. And finally, there is a type of surgery for patients with ulcerative colitis, where we remove the entire colon and create a pouch with a small bowel that we connect to the anus. Because the surgery goes down in the pelvis, it creates scarring tissue, and it can create infertility by preventing the eggs going from the ovaries to through the fallopian tube to the uterus. So women who, under, who uh, went, uh, are going through a colectomy and a pouch construction can have a decrease uh, in, in their fertility. And it's important to discuss with your doctor if you're planning to have a family, discuss other options than the surgery. All right, so the first question is, can uh, uh, pregnancy make my IBD worse? And the question is no. If you go into your pregnancy with your IBD under control, you have 75% chance of your IBD remaining under control during pregnancy. Um, if you go into your pregnancy with active IBD, so if you're flaring and get pregnant, then you have 75% chance of this disease remaining active or getting worse during pregnancy. So you start to see here this message that it's a very important to get when you're planning a pregnancy, that you're planning it at a time where your disease is controlled and doing well. The other way around, can, um, can, uh, can uh, the IBD affect pregnancy and pregnancy outcome. The worst thing we can do for our pregnancy, for a pregnant mom is to have the disease active again. If you have active disease and flare up at conception or during pregnancy, that is what puts pregnancy at risk. There's a high risk of losing the baby, having a baby who is small, uh, having premature baby and prematurity has a lot of complication. And there's a risk for mom to develop eclampsia, which is a pregnancy complication. So. Very important, again, to 
be in remission, maintain remission during pregnancy. If you flare during pregnancy, it's very important to tell your doctor right away because it's very important to control the flare quickly before we run into problem like losing the baby or having other uh, preg pregnancy complication. All right, so important to plan ahead. Uh, if you're planning to get pregnant, let your GI team know so that if there are medication they need to stop, we stop it. But mainly, mainly actually is to have this discussion to maintain the medication and to make sure that you are in remission uh, with blood work, stool tests, and colonoscopy. So the best time to get pregnant is when you're doing well off steroid on a stable drug regimen. Most medication are safe during pregnancy. The mesalamine, the thiopurine, the biologics, they're all safe during pregnancy. The one that are not and should be stopped way before we start planning a family are methotrexate and two other drug class, what we call JAK inhibitor and S1PR. It's important to know that women with IBD are at high risk of a pregnancy complication called eclampsia or preeclampsia. And so if you're a woman with IBD above the age 35, uh, your OBGYN will discuss with you starting an aspirin to prevent preeclampsia. All right, this is, a, I wanted to show this study. This is one of the biggest study uh, it, done in US. There are other similar study done in Europe showing that women with IBD, if they're um, during their pregnancy and conception, they are on biologic or thiopurine, it does not increase the risk of malformation in the baby. It does not increase the risk of pregnancy, negative pregnancy outcome. However, if you flare, that can increase the risk of complication. And being on IBD drug during pregnancy, does not increase the risk of infection in your baby when the baby's born and allow the baby to uh, uh, develop all normally. So there's no concern about having those medication on board where we're pregnant. Again, like I said, Jack inhibitor, S1PR, these need to be stopped before pregnancy. We do not recommend pregnancy on these drugs because these drugs cross into the placenta in the first trimester. So they affect the formation of the baby. But thiopurin, mesalamine, biologic, safe during pregnancy. All right, how about breastfeeding? Same thing, mesalamine, thiopurin, biologic, safe during breastfeeding, but we need to avoid breastfeeding if we're on methotrexate or uh, JAK inhibitor and S1PR. I'm going to end on this slide uh, because I think it's, um, you know, it's important. Uh, we, we just said that IBD is um, affect every race and ethnicity and uh, every country at this point, but it's important to recognize that some population uh, do not have access to, right, to, to the care that they need. That's when we talk about health disparities. And it's basically uh, based on um, where you're born, your zip code, where you know your access to your, your, your employment, are you able to afford medical care? Uh, where you're living, do you have access to uh, clean water, healthy food? Do you have access to a gastroenterologist? Do you have access to somebody specialized with IVD? Uh, patients who do not have access to the right education in terms of medical disease um, uh, or people who are uh, um, subjected to racism and discrimination. And in these patients, um, not having access to good IVD care uh, translate to having a high risk of complications from IBD, high risk of um, um, being hospitalized for IBD, high risk of dying from uh, inflammatory bowel disease and decreased access to effective therapy. So it's very important if you are part of a minority uh, or underserved population, um, whether it's in the US or outside, to really um, learn, you know, reach out to community and, and learn to advocate for yourself. And as physician and as a healthcare system, it's very important for us to advocate for our patient who traditionally have not had good access to care, uh, to provide them with all the quality care and the continuity of care that they need. So I'm going to end on this um, summary slide. IBD is a chronic illness that affects the GI tract and beyond. It affects your social, your mental, your physical, your financial health. Important to discuss with your doctor and get the support that you need. It's uh, therapies 
have potential risk, but overall they are safe and they are there to help um, uh, prevent disease complication, prevent flare and keep you healthy and give you the quality of life that you want and you, you need, uh, prevent, you know, allow you to have the job, the career, the, go study, have the relationship that you, that you want to have in your life. It's important to understand your treatment options and what, what why we choose certain therapies versus others and how important it is to monitor your disease, monitor the therapy to prevent complication. Important to keep an open communication with your uh, medical team, advocate for yourself, understand why it's important to do the, um, the certain vaccine and colon cancer screening and other cancer screening. What you can control is really stay educated, get up to date on what's going on uh, in the world of IBD, develop a support system um, around you, get information from reliable sources, uh, such as these amazing webinars, uh, and really seek help for mental health and develop a healthy uh, life hygiene in terms of diet, good sleep, physical activity. Uh, for in terms of pregnancy, healthy mom means a healthy baby, most drugs are safe during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Talk to your doctor when you're planning a family. And finally, um, if you, uh, uh, you know, it's important for all of us to work together as a physician, health system, patient advocate, and communities uh, to work together so that everybody has access to quality of care um, to uh, treat their inflammatory bowel disease. I'm going to stop here and I want to thank you for being with us tonight and we'll be opening uh, the floor for questions. Thank you, Dr. Sharabadi. Terrific information. And yes, we do have a lot of questions. So how about we just jump right to them? Okay. So our first question is from Bree and she wants to know, how does the approach to treating IBD slash Crohn's change when a patient has a connective tissue disorder like HEDS? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, so one thing is that one, if you have an immune condition, you have a high risk of having another immune condition, which can make uh, you know your medical care uh, more complex and 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 uh, require what we call a multidisciplinary approach, meaning the different doctors taking care of your connective tissue disease and your uh, IBD need to communicate um, because there are certain therapies that can help with both. There are certain therapies that are not indicated if you have one or the other, and uh, and, and really find uh, if we need to use more than one medication, making sure that we not using medication that increase your risk of complication, right? So most of the medication that we use can increase the risk of infection. So what we wanna do is minimize those risks by choosing uh, judiciously choosing the different medication. So very important to have your uh, team of doctors communicate and uh, and let your both doctor know about your other disease so we can find common ground in terms of therapy or if there's no common ground, is to find uh, treatment that don't increase your potential risk of side effects, right? Find the treatment that can, uh, can help with both while minimizing potential side effects and complication. Great, thank you very much. Our next question is from Carol, and she'd like to know how does IBS with constipation compare to IBD? That's a great question because IBS and IBD sometimes can get confused because they share two letters, but they are completely different disease. So IBD is, stands for inflammatory bowel disease, meaning when we look at the gut, we look at the colon, we see inflammation, we see ulcers, we see redness, you know, it, it, things are inflamed. IBS is irritable bowel syndrome. IBS is uh, typically defined by abdominal pain with diarrhea or constipation or a mix of both. In IBS, when we look at the colon, the colon is normal. And when we do blood tests for other condition, everything comes back normal. It doesn't mean that it's not a real thing, okay? So that's a very important point I wanna make. I IBS is a real diagnosis. It's not in your head. It's not, uh, uh, it's not because we're not seeing something that it, it's not something. Uh, IBS with constipation typically reflects, um, um, you know, so, IBS in general uh, is uh, due to uh, a abnormal motility of the gut. So how your gut moves, it moves too slow, you get constipation, moves too fast, you get diarrhea. In the gut sensation, often people with IBS feels bloating and pain more than people without IBS. So 
IBS is, is, is due to things that we don't see, right? We don't see inflammation, but it's a change in the sensation of the gut, the material of the gut. So IBS with constipation is treated with medication that allows, uh, that, that promotes good bowel movement, uh, change in the diet, like incorporating more fruits and vegetables, more water, lower body activity. So we always say uh, in my clinic, like if you want to move your bowel, you have to move your body. So whether walking, you know, biking, et cetera, all these things can help the bowel to move. So IBS with constipation is treated with uh, diet, water, lifestyle, and certain medication that helps the colon move move um, better uh, and, and, and to, in order to have regular bowel movement. Great. Thank you very much. Our next question is from BAMS, and um, they would like to know um, if you have a high school age uh, person um, who has lost a lot of energy and who has Crohn's disease, how, what would you do to uh, ensure him, like how to motivate him and uplift him? What would you recommend? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I'm so sorry for, um, you know, um, to hear that. And it, it, it's not, uh, so it's very important to know you and your teenager um, kid are not alone. Um, one thing to know is that uh, teenager with inflammatory bowel disease have a higher um, uh, risk of having also depression and anxiety, right? Teenager year are a year where, uh, these are years where you want to fit in with your peers, your you want to do these extracurricular activities. You want to go out. You're you're developing your body image. You you want to become independent from your parents. And here we have a disease like Crohn's disease that make you dependent on your parents to take you to the doctor. That you have symptoms that might prevent you from uh, going out with your friends. You you feel tired because of the inflammation or potentially anemia. And so uh, it really disrupt the whole normal teenager right development. So it's very important to um, to give um, teenager kind of, you know, as a parent, we're so understanding of our kids and we suffer when they're suffering, but it's important to realize that, um, uh, you know, it's, it, I don't want to say it's normal, but that, that's, that, that, that diseases really affect them at, at a different level. So a few things. One is in terms of fatigue, the most common cause of fatigue is having active inflammation. So it's important to know if the Crohn's is under control, if the if your teenager is on, on the right medication, and if the inflammation is controlled, you know, by again checking those inflammatory marker, looking at the colon, making sure everything is healed, because active inflammation is the number one cause of fatigue. The second thing is to make sure that um you know, we're not uh, having dealing with uh, uh, deficiency like anemia and iron deficiency. So a low level of iron that often happen in Crohn's that can get your energy down. And in people with Crohn's disease, replacing the iron by mouth like or oral pill does not help. It does, that does not work well. So often people need IV iron. Uh, another deficiency that can happen in people with Crohn's disease is B12. So making sure that iron, B12, all these things are corrected making sure that we are encouraging our teenager to have a healthy living, which is so hard to do with a teenager who has no disease and even more if you have somebody who's struggling with pain and diarrhea. But physical activity, eating healthy can really help. And then finally, becoming part of a community. Um, you know, in, in the US, and I don't know where you're living, but in the US, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation has a special chapter for young people. And they have like a, a camp, and a summer camp, for teenager living with IBD, they have a um, uh, support group for teenagers. So it's very important to get involved with, you know, uh, other uh, teenagers that also are living with this disease so that you can, you know, kind of develop this peer mentorship, sponsorship relationship, and feel like you're not, you're not isolated, you're not different than all the other kids in your class that are just doing well and being healthy. So it's important, there are resources like that. It's very important to address mental health and to um, uh, reach out to a therapist. Uh, and uh, you know the pediatrician can help you connect with the right therapist um, to address the depression anxiety that comes with this disease that cause also fatigue and isolation. So really important from um, controlling the inflammation, um, uh, correcting uh, deficiencies, uh, having a healthy um, lifestyle, connecting with peers, with, 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 with other teenagers, with IBD, having that support system, 
seeing a therapist and um and and just you know showing that kid all the love and support that that you know you can and and his or her community can great wonderful advice support groups are always wonderful yeah so good friends family and support yes. groups right yes yeah. but again recognizing that this is a disease difficult for everyone even more so for teenagers sure Okay, our next question uh, from Natalie. What are the areas where you see cancer with greater frequency in IBD patients? Right, so if you have IBD of your colon, whether it's ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, that puts you at high risk of colon cancer. The reason is you want to think of it like, uh, you know, if your bowel has been inflamed for a long time, something's going to go wrong. It's a little bit like having sunburn increases risk of sun uh, of uh, of skin cancer. Having you know smoking for a long time, irritating your lung, increases the risk of lung cancer. So, if you've had disease for more than eight years involving the colon, that put us at high risk of colon cancer. And this is when we start doing colonoscopy every one to two years to three years, depending on several factors uh, that, uh, you know, your doctors has to consider. But, um, you know, the general population gets colonoscopy every 10 years, right? And if you have a family history, it's every five years. But people with IBD, because of their higher risk, it's every one to three years. If you also have PSC, primary sclerosing cholangitis, it's every year from the start of the diagnosis. We don't wait eight years. The other risk of cancer is skin cancer. So skin check once a year with a dermatologist. And, uh, and then finally, um, um, there's a, could be high risk of cervical cancer, um, especially in people on uh, drugs like thiopurine, so pap smear routinely. So these are the main uh, cancer that, uh, that can be at uh, increased risk in people with IBD and that are important to be screened for. Great, thank you very much. Our next question is from Kim. Are there any Eastern medicines that can treat or cure IBD or IBS? Um, so uh, do you mean like more like complementary medicine or traditional medicine? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 So this is a very good question and I'm glad we're bringing it up and I'm going to answer it for the IBD part, right? So I, um, so for the IBD part, there, there's two sides to this answer. There's two, two answers. One is there's no cure for IBD. At this point, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. And it's very important to be very, um, uh, you know, careful uh, about people who claim that they cured their IBD. Um, they, we don't have a cure at this point. There's a lot of research, on, ongoing research. Like I said, we have so many new therapies that are specific to IBD that blocks what's going on in the inflammation in the gut. And so it's important to trust these medications. Okay. So we don't have a cure. There's nobody that can pretend that we have a cure. Now, can complementary medicine sort of supplement uh, help? They can help, but they cannot be the only treatment um, at this point, okay? So there are several studies that looked at complementary medicine, like curcumin, uh, for example, has been shown to help in addition to medication for a patient with mild ulcerative colitis. Um, so that could be an option. Certain probiotic can help in addition to medication can help patient with mild ulcerative colitis. So if you want to explore, um, you know, herbal medicine, you know, uh, um, and, and, and supplement, it's so important to talk to your doctor about it because, you know, to, to so your doctor needs to know what you're on. And also not everything that's natural is actually healthy or without risk. So uh, certain natural treatment can actually damage the liver. So it's very important to talk to your doctor about this. And typically when I give the okay is for, uh, for things that have been shown in, in studies that they work. So it's just somebody on the interim internet claiming that they use that and it worked doesn't mean that it works, right? So there should have to be studies. So, and I'm okay with that in addition to therapies. So, um, so that's my two, two, twofold answer. There's no cure. Don't get fooled by claims. If you want to use complementary therapies, talk to your doctors uh, because some natural substances have side effects. It's important for your doctor to know what you're taking. And some actually complementary therapies have been studied. And these, these are the ones that we are okay using in addition to um, the medication that we have available to us for IBD. 
Thank you very much. Uh, we're getting close to the eight o'clock hour, but just one quick question. Um, okay. I so tried to answer quick. <laughs> you go, you're trying to, yeah, and it's a big one. So yeah. is, is there any new research or, or treatments on the horizon to treat these, these gut conditions? Any hope? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, when I, well, when I was in med school, and I'm going to like reveal my age now by saying this, when I was in med school, we had one treatment for IBD. It was steroids, which I told you how bad it is for you, and thiopurine. Then when I started my, uh, my uh, uh, GI uh, fellowship, we had what we call infliximab, uh, which was the first biologic. Uh, now, a few years later, we have so many therapies. So our knowledge on what's causing the inflammation has progressed and our therapies have progressed. The next phase is really like trying to see, you know, we don't have a treatment that works for everyone all the time. And so trying to see if we can combine different medication, do we get better results? Right. But also there is definitely a desire and a push and, and a uh, work in the scientific community to try to really find kind of a cure, right? So we all want a cure. But at this point, we don't have that, but there's definitely an effort in that direction. There's also an effort into recognizing the role of the diet, of stress, how we can manage that and really identify what are those triggers. And maybe by removing those triggers, we can at least decrease the severity of the disease. And there is a recent, more recent interest in natural remedy and really trying to find what, what are the, you know, again, natural remedy that have anti-inflammatory property. So there's absolutely hope. Uh, science has been advancing a lot. It's, it's important to also realize, and that's what I tell my patient, there are very few diseases where we have a cure. So infections have a cure. You take the antibody for 10 days, you're done with the infection. But most diseases are actually chronic, right? Heart disease, hypertension, kidney disease, connective tissue disease, IBD, most diseases are unfortunately like chronic diseases. So the fact that we don't have a cure for IBD is not unique, but there's definitely an effort. And, uh, and, and you know, it's one of the field in GI where there's so much resources and research ongoing because obviously it's a disease that can be devastating and, and, and that's affecting now more and more people. Well, thank, thank you, Dr. Cherabadi. We're gonna end on that note. We're a little past the hour, but I'd yeah. like to thank you so much for coming on this evening. Wonderful and very important information. And I would like to thank all of you out there for joining us this evening. In the coming weeks, the video of tonight's live stream will be available on the A Women's Journey website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey under videos on demand. And if you've enjoyed tonight's discussion, please check out our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey for more information about upcoming webinars, our Health Insights That Matter podcast series and sign up for our monthly email. Thank you again for joining us. Have a good evening. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.